talking about. So um, <coughs> when you um, when, when you look at the uh, uh, like a piece of metal, piece of steel, right? It consists of, of crystals, right? The little grains that you see under optical microscope are, are single crystals, and um, and and so if if you would be able to do this <coughs> um, and identify. Uh, the crystal structure, you'll be able to see, uh, identify the orientation of the unit cell, yes? Um, now, when I say this, um, it sounds very, you know, simple, uh, your orientation of the uh, crystal. However, you know, an orientation doesn't mean anything if it's not uh, with respect to reference frame, right? So. So you have to, you know, orientation, you know, what's your reference, yeah, obviously. Um, what, what do I mean, for instance, if, if our reference uh, uh, coordinate axis was exactly the same coordinate axis as for this unit cell, this grain would be not, you know, oriented, you know, would be perfectly aligned to its own axis, right? So, but obviously, you know, um, what, what is important is the orientation vis-a-vis -vis the, what we call the, the, the laboratory coordinate system. You know, that's us and, and uh, you know, and, and, and a coordinate axis that we define uh, because it's, you know, it's an obvious one to choose. So for instance, when you roll material, yes, um, the you know you, you will choose a coordinate a laboratory coordinate axis you know along the uh, rolling direction transverse to the rolling direction and perpendicular to the rolling direction right so this and so and so that's what we do we you know we define the uh, the orientation of all our crystals you know with respect that to that laboratory um, um, uh, frame. Um, as you will, uh, coordinate uh, axis system. And, um, and so what, what, if we do this, uh, we, we find that uh, some steels, when you look at the orientation of the uh, crystals, um, uh, you know, they're randomly oriented. They don't have any particular uh, preferred orientation. Other cases, which happens very often, um, when you deform the material, uh, heavily uh, is that you see that the unit cells um, you know they're aligned not maybe uh, not uh, very precisely but you know there is a preferred orientation right and this this is what we call texture mm -hmm. and it, it, it has a big impact on the mechanical uh, properties this 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 texture mm -hmm. okay so what I just want to say so so there are methods to describe this, you know, which are uh, methods which, um, which allow to, uh, you to visually uh, present this texture, yes? And, uh, and so that, that's what I uh, want to talk about. So, so one of the things you can do, yes, is uh, use what we say uh, a, a stereographic projection, right? So what is stereographic projection? Relatively uh, simple concept. So, um, so just imagine here that this gray uh, uh, sheet here, gray sheet, you know, is, is, a, is a piece of rolled steel, yes, mm -hmm. that I orient um, with the rolling direction in this direction, the transverse direction in that direction, so it's, it's flat, it's lying flat you know, on, on a, a surface, and then um, the normal direction is my third Axis, and then and then I imagine uh, a plane, um, excuse me, a, a, a sphere hmm, around this piece of metal, right? Okay, and now I focus on a small grain, a single grain inside this sheet of material. Yes, and so and and this is this grain, this gray thing here. That's this grain. Hmm. And I've chosen, for as an example, that this grain has a 111 axis, yeah, 111 axis, perpendicular to the 
normal direction. All right? And so what I do in, a, um, in, in what we call a pole figure, which is a, uh, a, uh, a representation of orientation. Hmm? So for this little grain, this little crystal here, say the orientation is this. So now I uh, look at this grain and I, uh, for this particular example, yeah, um, I also put the 110 direction parallel to the rolling direction. This is actually uh, a, a relatively common orientation that the grains will have in a sheet of low carbon steel that's been uh, rolled. Okay? Okay, and now I, I focus on the 100 directions. This, so you can see them now. They're, they're well defined now, right? So they, they will have one uh, uh, orientation or direction that will be uh, one specific orientation uh, for this particular grain with this particular structure. Yeah? Um, not structure, but this particular orientation. All right? So now I, uh, I so this grain I, I is here, yes? And now what I do is I extend these axes you know, very far out of this crystal hmm, till they hit my sphere that I have drawn, imaginary sphere I've drawn around uh, my sample. Hmm? Okay? And now I do, what I do is I make a stereographic projection. Right? So stereographic projection is the following. Um, I looked at the equator plane, that's this light gray plane here of my sphere. Hmm? And I connect the points where the uh, one, one, uh, 100 type axis intersect the sphere. Yeah, this, this, this point I connect with the uh, apex. Yes. No, that's not the, apex. the lower point here, in the, the south pole, let's call it south pole, of my um, sphere here. Yeah. And I register the intersection points, yes? Okay. So I can basically uh, do this for many grains. You know, I just measure the grain, measure the grain, right? And put all these orientations, all these different uh, 001 type poles on this plane, yeah? And, uh, and I can just use this projection Yes, this stereographic projection as a way to represent texture. So let's let's see again how this works. Hmm. So this is what I just explained. A, for a single crystal, my stereographic projection will be this this uh, circular plane, and then these three um, uh, what we call these point poles. Yes, and, and you and so uh, this is this circular point. This circle. Uh, uh, stereographic projection circle, and these are these three points. This is for a single grain. Yeah. Um, say I do this for many grains. You know, I look at the grain next to it and next to it. And uh, well, if a material is textured, yes, then uh, you know I'll, I'll have other yellow points which will be close to this original point. This. Yeah. And I'll have many of them, of course. As many, you know, if I measure a lot, I'll, I'll get many points. Yeah? And you can see here, uh, these are single measurements. Yes. So I can now uh, use this, yes, and then mathematically, yes, um, uh, change this into a pole density. Yes. It, so it gives you an idea of, all right, um, in this area, yes. I have four times the, uh, the pole density that I should have if the orientation was totally random, yes? If the orientation is totally random, there will be, um, you know, there will be a, you know, definitely be a pole here, right? Okay? So, uh, so the pole density allows me to mathematically see how strong the, uh, the texture is. Hmm? Hmm? So I, it, it's basically a mathematical step here. You, you uh, go from these discrete points to describing a pole density. Hmm? Okay, so you have this. And, and then, of course, it's not very practical, this 3D um, 
representation. So you uh, uh, represent it in 2D, and then instead of having this, this, these pole densities, these, these peaks here, you, you just have density contours. Right? And, so, and, and this is a pole figure. Yeah? So, uh, the very common way to represent uh, texture preferred orientations uh, or absence of this preferred orientation. Yeah. The uh, problem is that with this approach, um, you don't capture all the texture components. You don't capture all the texture components. There may be grains that have a specific orientation and then grains which have another specific orientation, yes? And when the, the texturing doesn't have to be all the grains of the same preferred orientation also. Half of the grains can prefer to be in one direction. A large, another large number of grains are, have the, that specific orientation but rotated by 30 degrees, for instance. Yeah? And so you wouldn't see this um, very clearly. Um, and you would need to use many pole figures. Now, um, so, so what people uh, uh, did is they came up with the idea of using orientation distribution function. Yeah? And the approach is uh, different. Yeah? Um, you know that if you have a, uh, a laboratory coordinate axis, a reference uh, coordinate system, and you have another orthogonal coordinate system, other orientation, I have two, right? You know that uh, you can rotate one of them into the other, yes? yes. You can describe the, the relative orientation using Euler angles, yes? Euler angles, and, and to do this, you, you need three Euler angles, yes? So we, I'm not going to go into you know, which, how, how it works. You should know this from, uh, from um, math, uh, undergraduate math. But anyway, so two, two uh, orthogonal axes, you can you know, uh, relate their, <coughs> excuse me, their orientation using three uh, Euler angles. Yes? And that's the idea, basically. Um, so you again have your material, for instance, sheet material. You define a laboratory coordinate axis, rolling direction, transfer normal directions. That's one. And then you have a cubic, uh, you know, for steel you have a cubic unit cells, and so that means you have another set of uh, orthogonal axes. And with the uh, uh, and you can uh, describe their relative orientation by all your angles. So you need three Euler angles for, so for instance, this grain here, yes? If I have these three Euler angles, capital Phi, Phi 1, and Phi 2, yes? I know the orientation of that particular grain relative to my uh, laboratory uh, coordinate system. So, um, so let's uh, see how this works. Hmm? Um, so we have here a 3D representation yes, of um, uh, Euler space. So you have um, um, uh, phi 1 in this direction, phi 2 in this direction, capital phi in this direction. Do not ask me why capital phi axis goes down, right? I have no idea why they did that. but. Uh, you know, there's no profound reason as far as... So anyway, but that's the way it's usually represented, right? What the, 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 the z-axis down, okay. Um, so any orient... any point in this, what we call Euler space, is an orientation, right? So what, what you can do in, um, uh, in this approach to description of texture is every orientation of a grain you put point in the graph. Hmm? For instance, this point here corresponds to a, a crystal with a 001 plane parallel to the, uh, uh, the sheet, yes, and a 1 
bar one O direction parallel to the rolling direction. So, so this particular orientation would look like this here. So you can see uh, a, one of the uh, the O O one axis parallel to the normal direction, and then this direction here a one one O direction parallel to the rolling direction. So this would correspond to to this. And of course, the point here zero 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 means that. Uh, basically, my unit cell is oriented perfectly parallel to the, uh, the, 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 the unit vectors of my unit cell are parallel to the um, uh, laboratory reference frame. So at any point here, yes, will give me uh, a specific orientation. So that's for a single grain, yeah? what will be a single point. Yeah? If I have many grains, of course, I will get many points. If my material is randomly oriented, uh, these points will di be distributed all over Euler's space. You know, there will be no, but what we, what we see is that there is clustering of the points, yes, because of preferred orientation, okay? So again, this is not very um, uh, convenient to use the single measurements, yes? What we do is we create a uh, in three dimensions, we create a uh, density plot. We make surfaces of equal uh, density of uh, orientations. Yeah? Okay. Right, and then 3D representation is also not very convenient. Yes, um, and what we uh, most of the time do is we make sections through this space. Yeah? So if we make a section. Uh, through uh, through this uh, tube, if you want, of orientations, yes, uh, this is what we find. Yes. So in um, uh, in in, in steels and ferritic steels, yeah, the important texture components tend to lie on one plane in the Euler space. Yes. So uh, and that plane is defined by the uh, phi two angle equal to 45 degrees. Is it Th there in that section we see we can see most of the texture components? Yes, and and so we can analyze very quickly uh, whether or not there is a strong um, um, texture. Hmm? So what's here on the on the left is uh, a picture of this section where we have the specific texture components, specific orientations, yes, and, yeah. and here we have the actual, what we call the orientation distribution function, yeah. and it's, it's basically a section through the Euler space, and these lines here are density contours of orientation, so that means that here we have lots of orientation, lots of grains are, have, are close to this orientation. Lots of grains are close to this orientation. And many grains have orientations parallel, you know, lying, excuse me, lying along this, this line, yes? And, and, and this, this, line, this line here and this line there, they're, they're, they're called the fibers, you know, because they correspond to fiber textures. Hmm? Uh, this fiber here is called the gamma fiber, and it corresponds to uh, the uh, grains with a 111 axis parallel to the sheet plane, yes? This one here is the alpha fiber, yes? And it corresponds to grains with a 110 direction parallel to the rolling direction, yes? Mm? Okay? That's how we represent texture in um, in um, you know for, for polycrystalline materials and for um, in, in steels for, for ferritic steels, it's different for uh, you know austenitic steels. You know you have other uh, uh, preferred uh, orientations, and um, and so the the, um, the 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 texture the ODFs look different, of course. Yeah, All right. Okay, so let's uh, just this was just um, like. Um, to make sure uh, everybody was uh, 
uh, understanding what, what these uh, concepts was. Th this is also, if, um, I've also put it on the um, E-class, um, so you can uh, print it out and, and, and study uh, the material uh, if you want to. Right, so let's now uh, continue where we were. open this. Uh, last, uh, after class on Tuesday, one of you, I think it was you, right? No? So, was it you? So one of you came to me and said there's a problem with uh, uh, one of the formulas, and um, that was right. So I've, uh, in the meanwhile, corrected this. It's about the stacking fault energy. Uh, there we go. Right. So, so here, in this formula here, I had, I'd written uh, g here where where you have f gamma, I just written gamma, right? So this should be f gamma. It's a force. Yeah. It's it's not a um, uh, an energy term, okay? So if you <coughs> could repair that. Um, all right. All right, so let's um, continue where we had uh, left. I think we had uh, shown, um, yeah, um, so, so I already told you that there were two fundamental differences between there was uh, uh, fundamental differences between gamma r that equation is correct yeah 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 the equation with the uh, distance that is 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 uh, not wrong yeah uh, right so we we had said that uh, fundamental difference we do uh, gamma iron and austenitic steels and alpha iron and ferritic steels is that the stacking fault energy. Uh, in austenite, you can have, um, depending on the composition and the temperature, as, as uh, we discussed, you can have very low stacking fault energy, yeah, 10 millijoules per square meter, to about 100 and, and more. Yes. Um, so depending on the alloy you're studying, you can have very narrow uh, dislocation widths or very wide dislocation dissociation. Um, with uh, ferrite, it's totally different. The um, uh, uh, stacking fault energy is very, very high. Yes. And so it, uh, dislocation is never dissociated in uh, ferritic steels or in alpha iron. Okay? And we'll see today that this has an important impact. Uh, right, we, so we discussed these two uh, things here, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, w when you're playing around with dislocations, dislocation reactions, in the austenite you, you will be using uh, this handy tool uh, to uh, be able to describe the uh, uh, dislocation reactions. It's, it's a, a tetrahedron which consists of glide planes in the, in the austenite. And the edges are Burgers vectors, undissociated Burgers vector. And uh, you have different slip system in BCC, right? There, 1, 1, O planes are prevalent. We'll say something more about this uh, today. But 1, 1, O planes are prevalent glide system. So this is a... Um, uh, rhomb rhombic uh, dodecahedron. Again, all the planes here are 1, 1, 0 planes, and the edges are Burgers vectors. And, and um, they are 1, 1, 1, uh, so A, of, A upon 2, 1, 1, 1 uh, uh, vectors. And these things are very convenient to, much more convenient that, than the conventional unit cell, yes. Uh, because they, they allow us to quickly see, uh, you know, what, uh, what happens to dislocations, right? Right, okay, so this is where we were. Um, so you remember uh, when I was um, t 
talking um, about uh, the Thomson tetrahedron. Uh, let me put this down so you can all see this. So you have, um, you had, uh, we'll just use the, the letter notation rather than the, um, so you have A, B, and C, yeah? point, this, this point here, this fourth point is D, yeah? and the ABC plane is, um, you know, if, if you look at the lecture note, that's the same as the 111 plane, yes? And we had uh, here, in the middle here, we had, uh, sorry, it's like this, hmm? delta. Um, and so this vector here, we saw, can dissociate into uh, these two vectors. Hmm? So, and, and we write the reaction, A, B is A, uh, delta plus delta B, all right? So this reaction. Now, um, again, um, there is a convention to uh, take into consideration um, is that when a dislocation uh, in uh, FCC metals uh, dissociates, yes? And it dissociates in two pieces. Hmm? So this would be, um, um, where do you put, where do you put A delta and where do you put delta B? Right? Well, it depends. It, it depends on what kind of stacking fault you have. And you, you remember we had two, two options of stacking faults. Is it w one option was to uh, have a stacking fault that looks like a little sliver of uh, HCP. The other uh, option was to have um, a stacking fault that looks like a little sliver of twin. Yeah? And um, so it, it basically depends. However, I told you that um, in... Uh, in, in, in most metals and alloys, uh, the um, stacking fault uh, is intrinsic, intrinsic. So it looks like an HCP sliver. Yeah. Now, why is why would that be? Well, in general, uh, the argument is. Uh, when you make an HCP sliver, HCP stacking fault, what, remember what we did is you can uh, uh, look at it as if you had removed a plane, removed a crystal, uh, uh, a lattice plane. When you have the other type of uh, stacking fault, which looks like a little twin, the equivalent, the way you can make it, yes, is by inserting two lattice planes. Yeah? You, put two lattice planes in. So uh, the extrinsic stacking faults have a higher energy yes, than the intrinsic stacking faults. So that is the reason why we see intrinsic stacking faults. Yes? And that's the reason why we can calculate uh, intrinsic stacking faults using free energy difference of gamma and epsilon. Yes? Also, if it, if it was a twin, you know, it would, you know, the twin has the same crystal structure, so the stacking fault energy would basically be zero, right? Um, right. So, um, so it's, it's intrinsic. And so, when you when uh, this happens, when when we have this, yes, the uh, a delta is on this side, and uh, uh, delta B is on that side. Okay, so, so, so you remember this, your right hand rule, yes? Okay, now if you want to go one step further, and you almost always have to do this in FCC because most of the time your dislocations are dissociated, yes? You do the same thing, that gives you BA, and then when it's dissociated, you need to know, you know which one is left, which one is right. 
the partial with the Roman letter is always on the right. Yeah. So uh, I I just of course you know you forget this. You know. So I usually remember this right by thinking Romans are always right. Just a memo, memo, technical way sentence to remember. Uh, yeah. Um, so, just to tr because for me, I, of course, this is convention. You need to know it, and um, but it's 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 um, it's it's very convenient. Um, and the reason is, um, you know, when you have dislocation reactions uh, in uh, FCC metals and alloys, such as austenitic steels. When they meet, yes, um, the two uh, partials may be reacting with each other, forming another partial. And if you don't have the, uh, the partials correct, you know, you may end up saying, oh, you know, they will repel, there will be no reactions or whatever, right? So you, in order to understand um, you know, more advanced uh, concept, and we'll see one today when we talk about uh, Lomer, Lomer locks, yeah? Um, you know, you need to, you need to know uh, you need to know this. But again, this is um, you know the convention. So hmm? it's important to, to remember the convention, and uh, and you'll be so. That's for again. Don't start start talking about partials in uh, ferritic steels or alpha iron, right? You will really greatly upset me. And don't talk about Thomson tetrahedra to uh, to describe dislocations in alpha iron, right? It's, there's no dissociation in alpha iron, and you certainly never use a Thomson tetrahedron to analyze dislocations in, in alpha iron, okay? Right. Right, so, so, um, so for instance, uh, remember the, the loop we had, dislocation loop, uh, um, uh, say for instance, uh, our, uh, uh, so this would be for instance, uh, yes, here for instance, uh, Say we have uh, okay, like this orientation, and I have here a dislocation loop on this plane. Yeah? Um, so let's uh, let's let's make it a little bit geometrical, you know, like this. Yeah. Right. So, and, and uh, let's say this the, the Burgess vector of this dislocation loop is is in this direction. It's B, uh, uh, AB, right? That's the Burgess factor. So, um, uh, I'm going to use my, my rule here. So, uh, I've, I've said, um, so I, I know where the B is. Right? So, now I do have to, you know, to know where the extra half planes are. I have to uh, uh, define a, a direction. Yeah. So, so what, what I do now is like, okay, this is my uh, uh, B vector, yeah? And uh, here, yes, I'm going into the edge orientation, right? It's, it's turning, right? Like here it's edge, okay? So I have B here. U, uh, U is, 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 is going around, right? U is going like this. Huh? It, it's, it follows the line, right? So I have U in this direction, B in this direction. So my extra half planes are up on this side, huh? On, on this side, yes, the B is the same, but U now points at me. It points at, the hero is pointing away from me, now it points at me. So, um, uh, so I, I do the same. Uh, this is my line direction. My Burgess vector is, is still AB, so it's like this. So my extra half planes are down, right? Okay. Right. And, and so, uh, so, so here my extra half planes are down, uh, up, here, down. Of course, when it's dissociated, yes, it means that uh, the dislocation actually looks like this. You know? uh, ex two extra half planes pointing up and two extra uh, uh, half planes pointing down, yes? And so what you need to have also, so now if, uh, if I uh, may, uh, let's oops, have a look here. Uh, so I said, um, so AB is uh, A delta delta B, yes? So delta B is on this side, 
A delta is on this side, right? The Romans are uh, on this side. Oops. Okay. So, so this one here again, uh, A delta is on the right. Okay. So it's it goes like this. This. Yeah. This is A delta. Yeah. This is this one, and uh, delta B is on the left. Yeah. It's it's like this. All right. Delta B. Okay. All right. And it's the same around here, all around. Okay. So that this vector, so the, the uh, inside here, this is on this side. This is a delta, right? So it's a delta everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere a delta. This partial dislocation. Okay. So here the extra half plane is up. Here the extra half plane is down. Yeah. So the, the loop can still collapse. So when the, if the loop say uh, becomes smaller and smaller, yes, this extra half plane will uh, um, come together with this one, and the dislocation will disappear. Okay. As as it should be. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, and um, right. So now I need to uh, jump ahead here because uh, it was just some in something I had inserted. Uh, right. And now we come to 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 to, to uh, this here. All right. And it's the uh, we introduce a, a concept of a line tension mm -hmm. uh, that is similar but not the same as uh, you know, surface tension of, uh, of a liquid, for instance. When you have um, a liquid film, like a soap film, and you, you, you can extend it, extend the surface, yeah, the um, surface tension yes, will uh, make it such that you, you need to apply a force to make this surface larger. Hmm? Okay. So we have something similar in, for dislocations, and we, we call this the line tension. And of course, it's related to the energy, right? So it's, it's uh, the derivative of the energy, basically. Hmm? Um, and what it basically means is that um, if, if you imagine a dislocation as a, uh, a, uh, a wire, yes, mm -hmm. uh, when you, uh, it will always want to be uh, very straight, yes. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you imagine, <coughs> excuse me, a, um, this, this dislocation all by itself, yeah, you, you can, and, okay, very, very often, uh, in the future, I w instead of talking about dislocation, yes, I will talk about dislocation segments, yes, and basically that's a piece of dislocation which can be short or long, whatever, yes, that is uh, stuck at some kind of pinning points, yes. yes so it's like it's like like the dislocation is like uh, pinned in these two positions, yeah. The uh, the, the reason why we use this uh, image very much uh, in, in practice is, is because that's usually what happens to dislocations. They, uh, uh, they, they, they not, f you know, big dislocations which don't interact with anything, yes, in, in your uh, grains. Uh, most of the time they just run into each other, yes, and, and they pin each other. Or, you know, if you're... If you're um, uh, your steel or your, uh, contains uh, precipitates. You know they'll, they'll run into these precipitates that will prevent them from moving. Yeah, or um, if you have alloying elements, they will run into that particular alloying element and be more or less pinned by the presence of this alloy. So, so that's why we you know we usually think of dislocations not as long uh, dislocations, but as dislocation segments that are pinned. Yes. Okay, uh, so this, here you have such a dislocation segment, hmm? and um, we have 
you know, we apply certain force to this dislocation segment and say uh, the, the forces are such that the dislocation uh, you know, takes on a certain um, uh, circular shape. Hmm? So you, you have to imagine here I have some kind of shear force, which I call tau, yes? And um, so I can, you, you remember, we, uh, we can calculate what this force is on the dislocation using the, the peach color uh, formula. And um, um, so that, that force will be um, tau times the, the Burgess vector of that dislocation. Hmm? Um, right. Good. Um, now, if I um, would cut a piece of uh, this dislocation out of the, the dislocation, it would, um, in order to, to keep it in the same shape, yes, um, I, would, I need to have something that balances the, the, the force I applied. Yeah? So, so I cut this here. So let's say this is a pair of scissors. I cut this out. Yeah? And I, I look at this piece. And um, if I don't do anything, yes, um, it's going to run away, right? right? Just because there's only this force. Right? So the, the, the balancing force, yes, the, the thing that, that, that keeps uh, the, uh, the dislocation in equilibrium, th that's the line tension. Hmm? And so you, you imagine it as being a vector along the uh, uh, dislocation line, yes? And uh, remember, it's, it's uh, I, I said uh, mo uh, a few moments late, uh, previously, is that this, this um, uh, force is related to the energy of your uh, dislocation. So it's a derivative of uh, this energy. And, uh, and, and, and so we have an, based on that, we know what the um, uh, size typically is of a, uh, the line tension. It's GB square over two, yes? Of course, this equation is a, is a very simplified equation. It doesn't have, you know, it, it, it's, it just gives you an order of, a pretty good order of magnitude, but um, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's different. The, uh, this line tension will be different uh, depending on the, the type of dislocation you have, yes? Uh, depending on uh, the dislocation direction, etc. So you, there are many more advanced uh, formulas, but this is a, a pretty good one to work with, uh, and, and certainly in, in, the, in this course, right? All right, so, um, so this is the same thing here. So we assume, uh, we will very often assume that uh, the shape that the dislocation <coughs> has is a, is a semicircle, is a, you know, we can uh, look at it as, as being uh, a segment of a circle, yes? It, Again, it does not necessarily have to be this way, uh, but it's a good uh, approximation. So if we have a segment uh, DL, yeah, uh, the angle here is called D theta, and, and the, um, the semicircle has a certain uh, radius, hmm? radius of curvature. So the um, line uh, tension, yes, has a component in the horizontal direction and a component in the vertical direction. The component in the horizontal direction, they balance each other, right? These two balance each other. So what is important here is the, the vertical component of the uh, line tension hmm? that, you, uh, that you have to um, consider, okay? Right, so we can do some um, really uh, interesting calculations 
even uh, with this uh, very simple model. So, um, so first of all, we, uh, we look at what is the size of these, uh, the vertical component of the line tension. Yeah? So that is, I have one here. This is uh, uh, so the, the projection of T, uh, vertical projection. You can easily calculate it because this angle here, yes, is equal to half this angle. It's uh, from geometry. Okay, so and the um, uh, the force on the dislocation is tau, yeah, tau times b to be multiplied with the length of the dislocation, which is dl in this case. So, so tau b dl is balances t times d theta, okay? And, uh, well, dl here is this angle, uh, d theta times r, right? So dl can be replaced by r d theta, yes? And now I, t I take these two equations together and I just say, I express the equilibrium of forces, yes? So this here is equal to that, yes? And I can uh, uh, now uh, calculate the relation between the radius of curvature and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the applied, external applied uh, uh, force, yes? So uh, obviously if I have a very large uh, shear force, the R, value, the R will go down and I'll, I'll have a, a, a more circular shape to the uh, dislocation. Right, so let's, uh, so this, this equation that was down here is now up here. So, th th so there is a relation between the uh, applied, uh, the, the, the shear force on the slip plane of the dislocation and the radius of the dislocation. And there is a, um, an example here of, um, how you apply this uh, formula. So for instance, in, um, when you fatigue materials, when you fatigue steel, yeah, you know what fatigue test is, right? You uh, uh, have an um, uh, uh, oscillating uh, force, yes? And you apply this for thousands of times, yes? Uh, well, if you look at the microstructure of uh, the, the, the steel then, yes? Uh, what you find out is that uh, you've got this in incredibly nice uh, three-dimensional organization of uh, dislocations. You have very dense dislocation bands here, yes, and then channels with almost no dislocations. Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, these bands consist entirely of um, uh, edge dislocations, whereas the, dis the few dislocations we see here are edge dislocations. Very interesting uh, and intriguing um, microstructure. Uh, what, you can, what you also see is that um, rather regularly you, you see that some dislocations are form um, semicircular uh, loops, like, like the one there on top. Hmm? So what I can do is I can now uh, try to imagine, okay, could there be any stress in the material, yes, that will cause the dislocation to, to assume this shape? Stress, for instance, due to the presence of this you know, high density of uh, edge dislocations. Hmm? And um, so what I do is, uh, so I measure the radius of this, this loop here. Hmm? And, uh, and I plug it into this formula, yeah? I don't need much more, you know, much to calculate because G is the uh, shear modulus and B is my Burgess vector, so I know these things, yes? So I plug this in and I find 27 me megapascal, right? And so um, you can actually use this, uh, the formula, uh, if you have in your microstructure managed to freeze in, 
Yes, the, the position of the dislocation uh, before you make a sample you know, or be, before you remove the stress. You know? So what, um, obviously, uh, in this case, there was no external stress. It was just stress inside the material, the internal stresses. Mm -hmm. But in other cases, you, you, you know, the dislocation will assume a, sh a certain shape because you apply an external stress, right? In that case, to freeze in the, 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 the dislocation in their position, you will, for instance, irradiate the material, yes? So you create lots of uh, point defects, which will pin the dislocation in their stressed position. And then after that, you make a sample and you can, you know, you can measure the, uh, the shape of the, the radius of the dislocations and then from there determine what was the shear stress on these dislocations. Hmm? Just using this, this um, equation. Hmm? Okay, so um, now let's uh, look at um, an essential difference between uh, ferrite, ferritic steels, austenite, and austenitic steel. And the big difference, uh, re, uh, which is a direct consequence of the stacking fault energy, is the way cross-slip happens. Okay? Okay. So let's just uh, uh, look at um, our uh, slip planes here, BCC slip planes. Okay? And uh, so let's just say I have uh, this, you, you know, all the edges are Burgess vectors, right? So um, I'm looking at the plane here, yes? Um, I can see I have four edges, yes? One, two, three, four, yeah? So I have uh, four Burgess vector. Of course, these two are the same, yes? So I have two, two Burgess vector. Uh, actually, I still have four because I, have, I can have a Burgess vector in this direction and in this direction. So they are actually four, right? If I take into account the, the sign of the Burgess vector. So let's say we have the, a, a Burgess vector here, and, um, and I have a dislocation here, so uh, uh, just to make my life, our life easy, yes? Um, we'll just uh, make it nice and uh, rectangular, yes? And so this is the Burgess vector, yes? And um, also for the sake of convenience, I don't know if I'll use it, but let's say I've, I've also defined a line direction. All right, so um, <coughs> the, uh, can everybody see it? Um, so say uh, this, uh, I apply a stress and the dislocation loop, the size of the dislocation loop increases, yeah? All right, what happens here? What, what, what can happen when the dislocation encounters this plane? Well, let's think. Uh, this Burgess vector is the same as this Burgess vector. Hmm. So if I had, instead of having this uh, situation, if I had had a similar dislocation here, like this, hmm, that piece of dislocation would be exactly the same as that. Yes? So for these pieces of dislocations, yes, you can, you can get what is called cross-slip. This piece of dislocation can just uh, move move from here yeah. Let me just keep the dimension from here to here. When it does that, it's on another glide plane, yeah, and it's cross-slipped. Now, it cannot happen to all the segments of the dislocation. It cannot happen to the edge parts, yeah? Because the edge parts, they're, um, so the, the burger spec like this, but the, the line is in this direction, right? So it cannot go into the other slip plane, another slip plane. All right, so 
only screw dislocations can cross-slip. Only, only screw dislocations can cross-slip. Okay? Only cr screw segments of dislocations. Yeah? Right. Now, okay, let's uh, continue our story here. So now I have, I have this, this plane. This, this plane is the same as this one orientation-wise, but it's, it's not the same plane. It's parallel to this one, but at a certain distance. Now, what happens if this dislocation that's now here, which used to be there, decides, let's say, because of the applied stresses, yeah, that it wants to go back to a plane that's parallel to this? There's no problem. It can just go here. Yeah? So I can have dislocation move up, down, to another glide plane, yes, by cross-slipping, yes? Let's do the same s with uh, our, uh, yeah, let's do the same with our FCC crystal, okay? So, um, so, so in this case, I, I need to put it down on this white board here. Okay, so let's see what happens here. If in this case, let's say we have a dislocation here. Yeah. This, and this would be the Burgess vector. This would be my line direction. Yeah. Okay. Now this dislocation size increases and the screw part arrives at this point, yes? So this plane, that's, that's this plane, so it's also glide plane. This Burgess vector is also a Burgess vector in this plane. So the dislocation can move the screw segment can move into this plane also. It can also cross-slip. However, yes, and this is the big difference, our dislocations here in FCC, they are dissociated. Yeah? So the Burgess factor here isn't parallel to this. Hmm? Um, so let's uh, see. So let's see. So, so let's say it has uh, this vector, yeah, this vector, yeah? and the other one has this vector. You can see this vector here is not a vector of this plane. Yes. So the dislocation cannot glide into the other um, uh, glide, the other glide plane because it's dissociated. And the dissociations, the, the, the partial dislocations, are not Burgers vector of this cross-slip plane. So no, no cross-slip. No cross-slip unless we manage to pinch the dislocation, push the two partials back together, yes, and, they, and, and remove the dissociation. Okay, so this is what happens here. This is what I just drew uh, there. So you have one dislocation here, a, a screw segment here, yes? If it's dissociated, yes? First, I will need to remove uh, the dissociation. Then I can get uh, cross-slip, yes? And then, of course, the dislocation will, again, dissociate, yes? making it again difficult for that dislocation to cross-slip again. Hmm? That happens when you have a low stacking fault energy steel. If you have a very high stacking fault uh, material, steel, then of course it's, there is no dissociation and, and the cross-slip will be easy. Yeah? Okay. In uh, ferritic steels, we have huge stacking fault energy, so there's never any problem for the screw dislocations to, to hop from one 
glide plane to another one, yes? And that is very, very uh, fundamental difference because in the case of uh, ferrite and ferritic steels, your dislocations can easily change glide plane. They easily change glide planes. So if they run into an obstacle, whatever, yes, uh, a solute atom, another dislocation, a precipitate, yes, um, they can just go around it. They can just go uh, change glide planes and uh, circumvent the obstacle. Not so in low stacking fault austenitic steels. Yes. There, the dislocations will tend to stay on their original glide plane, whatever. Yes. And so, as a consequence, these two uh, crystal structures have very different strain hardening behavior. This material strain hardens much less than this one. Yes? Because cross slips makes uh, the obstacles less efficient as pinning points. All right? Okay, so, so I think um, it's a pretty good uh, moment to stop. So you, I can uh, let it sink in, as it were. Uh, I remind you of the fact that uh, today is Thursday, um, uh, that tomorrow at f f 3 o'clock we have, we meet here again for the, uh, for the makeup classes, yes? Uh, yeah, and that's the most important point I had to make. Thank you very much. <laughs>